Humiliated, their empire lost, the Athenians looked for someone to take the blame for their defeat. They searched for an enemy within their city walls, someone who had dared to question their dreams of supremacy. They searched for Socrates. Socrates was a critic. He was critical of the thinking and the thought processes of his fellow citizens, and he was critical about the public affairs of Athens. For over 50 years, Socrates had been publicly questioning and attacking the traditions of Athenian life. And around him, he had gathered a group of youthful followers. Surely, this must have weakened the city's moral character, undermined her hunger for glory. Socrates was arrested on charges of undermining the state religion and corrupting the youth of the city. I am quite sure that, especially in a relatively small society like Athens, someone who is constantly questioning the principles by which the society has traditionally governed itself, who we perceived as a very major danger by at least some people in society. You can easily see that a few hundred people might want him out, and they did. The Athenians would now put to trial the one man who dared to question the way they lived their lives. Socrates' trial would be held in Athens' central marketplace under a canopy to shade the fierce heat of the Greek sun. He would be tried by a jury of his fellow citizens, chosen at random, the same kind of group that had condemned six generals to summary execution only seven years before. Socrates would be given only a limited time to defend himself for all speeches in the Athenian courts were timed by a water clock. One jar of water steadily running into another. But Socrates shows no fear in the face of his accusers. In fact, he is positively stubborn. To put it bluntly, I've been assigned to this city, as if to a large horse which is inclined to be lazy and is in need of some great stinging fly. And all day long, I'll never cease to settle, here, there, everywhere, rousing and reproving every one of you. It is not an approach designed to win sympathy. Socrates is setting himself and his life against the entire Athenian state. He is doing what he thinks is the right thing to do. He thinks the life he has chosen, this life of thinking for yourself, is the best life. As he says in his speech, the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. If Socrates had simply apologized to the court, he might well have been acquitted. But instead, he demands free dinners for life, for all the work he has done. I can just imagine what that jury and the audience of that trial must have thought at the time. They must have been absolutely speechless. When the final vote came, the verdict could hardly have been a surprise. The court found Socrates guilty with the penalty of death. But Socrates reacted with calm and serenity. Well now, it is time to be off, I to die and you to live. 
But which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but heaven. Socrates was taken from the court to Athens prison. The site of this prison still exists. We can still trace the layout of the cell in which Socrates was probably held. And we still have accounts of Socrates' last days from friends who visited him in his cell. Socrates would be executed in the traditional Athenian manner by drinking hemlock. Some of the hemlock cups used for the poison are still preserved. Death by hemlock is excruciatingly painful, causing gradual paralysis of the central nervous system. But as the moment of his execution drew near, Socrates turned to his friends, treating the whole affair as if it were nothing at all. For me, the fated hour calls. In other words, I think it's about time I took my bath. I prefer to wash before drinking the poison, rather than give the women the bother of washing me when I am dead. But as the hemlock was poured, his friends broke down we have the account of one named Fido. In spite of myself, the tears came pouring down so that I covered my face and wept brokenheartedly. And then everyone in the room broke down, except Socrates himself, who said, really, my friends, what a way to behave. I'm told that one should make one's end in a reverent silence. Calm yourselves and be brave. As Socrates lay back on his bed and let the poison take effect, his friends watched in silence. Here was a man who was dying not for glory, not for fame and honor, but for the sake of his principles, because he believed that man should question the world around him. It was a sight they would never forget. Socrates, in his life and in his death, becomes a completely new Greek hero. From now on, the hero is a person of conviction, a person who will follow nothing but the dictates of his intellectual conscience, and that is a new conception of what a human being is like and what a good human being must be like. 